Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bow Valley Nonprofit Speaker Series. Just going to give people a couple more minutes to join us. You're welcome to uh, introduce yourself in the chat box, including the name of the nonprofit that you're associated with. That would be great. Thanks for having your camera on, Brenda. Lovely to see faces. Yeah, absolutely. I know I hate, to, I, I instruct online, so I totally understand the need to have a camera on. That's awesome. <laughs> Instead of speaking into an abyss. Totally. Little, circles with names. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's why we decided to shift it to a Zoom meeting today instead of a Zoom webinar so we could see faces. Perfect. Great, so we'll just give people another minute or so to join the meeting before we get started. All right, I think we're almost at noon here, so I'm gonna start the introduction. I'm sure we'll get a few more people joining us. So hello and welcome to the Bow Valley Nonprofit Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. You could please introduce yourself in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, including the nonprofit you're connected with. The Bow Valley is located in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot, the Tutsina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Metis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in this Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd like to say thank you to Tara and Ruth at FCSS at the towns of Canmore and Banff for sponsoring these events. Today, I'm honored to welcome Kathy Irvine to, uh, to the speaker series. Kathy Irvine is the co-founder of Watershed Organizational Development Group. She's been helping organizations in public, private, and not-for-profit sectors since 2003. With over 20 years of leadership and training experience, she shares her extensive knowledge on leadership and management skills, change leadership, knowledge transfer, and employee engagement practices. My name is Moselle Dibden. Now let's welcome Kathy. Super. Thanks very much, um, Moselle. Yeah. And just a real uh, pleasure to be here today. I have to say I'm starting to, as much as Zoom has been great for these and uh, events and um, giving lots of opportunity, I have to say I love not necessarily getting fully dressed for some of these events. <laughs> Um, I am starting to miss the the person to person interaction. I, I think um, uh, the Bull Valley not for profits uh, organization that Mazelle that you're part of is just really offering uh, just an extraordinary resources for not for profits, and I think it would just be that much more delightful if we could uh, spend a little bit of time networking in person and uh, getting to know one another. So the invitation here for sure um, is to invite you to put your uh, video camera on. For those of you that might have been listening to Brenda and Moselle and I chat as we came on, it really is quite lovely to have um, people's uh, faces to look at as I'm, uh, I'm speaking with you. Uh, the other thing that um, you could do as well, and this is super as I see in the chat box that folks are starting to... Um, uh, type in who they are and where they're from. You can also just do a right click, I think, on your name as well and, and pop in uh, the name of the not-for-profit that you're representing um, to. Uh, so we've got, Mazel has given me the hosting status, which means I actually have to let people in as, uh, as I'm talking. So I'm, I'm, I think I'll be okay with that, but at any point in time, if I look distracted, it's because I'm letting somebody in the door. Um, the other thing that I would invite um, as much as we can, now this is, this, this topic of strategic planning for your not-for-profit, not it can be a little bit dense, and I was also chatting with Mazelle. At some point, you folks may be thinking, holy catfish, I'm drinking from a fire hose here because there's a ton of information. The other reason that I may be talking a little faster than what might be professionally appropriate is I'm, I, I have a lot... I, we do a lot of strategic planning. Like it's, it is fun, it's exciting, it's super challenging in some cases. 
Um, but what I do hope that you folks come away with is that get a, a sense of what a strategic plan is, that you get a sense of how to engage with the street strategic planning project, you know, who's get a sense of who can be involved in a strategic planning um, project. Um, really have a, in some cases, I'm going to say be reminded of what are some of the components of a strategic plan for those of you that have been part of um, planning in the past. And then what can you actually do with the plan? So what I hope you've had a chance to do is uh, download the um, slide deck, the handouts that uh, Moselle has mailed out to. I'm going to be moving through those. Uh, sent in a in a format that hopefully, um, if you printed them off, you can um, uh, write on them. But the other side of that coin is, um, I think it's a writable PDF. I think. Anyway, so let's just jump right into um, really defining what a strategic plan is. Um, as I go through this slide deck, um, I really encourage if folks have a, a comment or a question, pop it into the chat box. But even better is if you can actually activate your uh, raised hand in the system. So don't just raise your hand, but if you activate the hands up icon, then you actually move to the front of my screen so I can see you. And for folks that have um, some experience in hosting on Zoom meetings, um, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate that request, I'm sure. So when we think about a strategic plan and when we honestly, when we think about an organization, it's like, where are you going? Like, what is your organization about? What are you doing? And what's your plan to get there? So when we think about a strategic plan, where we really, and we think about what's the importance of it, we want to be just a, a, a aware of that this tool provides a high level direction. It provides a high level direction to anybody that touches your organization. It, it, it is such a, um, what we believe is a very important tool for good governance. And again, if you would have been part of most cells in my conversation, if, if the, uh, as we were just waiting to open the door, we, we started talking about, you know, what is good governance and, and how can your board of directors support organizations rather than become a, a cumbersome and body of individuals that while keen, you're needing to educate. So if you've got a good plan in which the board of directors has really been partnering, um, it really does offer the opportunity for really quite extraordinary good governance. Um, really firm believer, and you'll hear this um, a couple of times for sure, is uh, good strategic planning allows funding towards achieving goals. It also, a good strategic plan also um, allows uh, effective um, communication between the funders and um, your organization. Um, sustainability is a term that we're using just about in every organization. It doesn't really matter what you're doing these days. Sustainability, sustainability of funds, sustainability of leadership, sustainability of people, sustainability of the importance of the work that you're doing. And really, ultimately, where we're going with this is to um, uh, create something that really aligns efforts efforts of everyone in your organization um, uh, to be focused on the priorities going forward. So I just want to just take a pause here and welcome some folks. I just let a whole bunch of people in, uh, in the room. So welcome. Uh, just really thrilled to have you. Uh, invitation here is to pop your video camera on and uh, just be part of the part of the faces of the conversation. Also to please don't hesitate to use the raise hand icon. You're gonna, that'll move you into the front of the, um, the, the camera or the uh, video um, flow for me and I'll be able to call on you. So again, welcome. So just a, a quick uh, visual uh, to get us started on um, the strategic plan and what it really it encompasses. And we're gonna start from the bottom here and we identified it in two segments. One is governance. One is what we strongly believe the responsibility of the board of directors. And that is 
where's the organization? What, what, is the, what are the future aspirations? And we'll talk more about the vision and our mission and, and the values. And, our, and we kind of we kind of think about the values of an organization are completely and totally all encompassing. So um, the strategic plan that involves the values, the vision, the mission, the success measurements and the priorities really comes under what we believe is the purview of the board of, uh, board of directors. And then um, all of that feeds into the strategies, the activities and the performance objectives. And that's the purview of the management. That's the purview of the executive director and their team. And, and we're pretty, we're pretty, we're pretty rigid on that when we talk with organizations as a consulting firm um, to not-for-profits. We really want to help um, the executive directors and the folks that are um, actually doing the work on the ground have as much autonomy and of freedom to be able to make the right decisions that they need to uh, going forward. The other piece that I wanna bring to the attention here is that everything that you do from in this visual, from the top down is in service to the mission. So performance objectives are going to be um, identified and uh, prioritized through the activities. The activities are going to be identified as a result of the strategies that come out. The strategies are um, identified through the priorities that the board of directors um, identifies. And I just want to um, make a point here too in that the language that you see there as soon as we hit success, priorities, strategies, and activities, that becomes very, very uh, open to discussion, open to um, what's the language that fits the organization. I'm, I'm just using these as a way of kind of um, feeding into the conversation, but please know that for the most part, and actually I'm about to show you a sample in which the vision and the mission have even changed um, the, the terminology around. But a good plan indicates Everything is in service to the ultimate vision. And, you know, I think back to, I've been working with not-for-profits since, uh, I love this line, since the turn of the century. And uh, I even remember, thank you for those of you that are laughing, you appreciate that. Yeah, maybe you've been there too, or just the, the whole ridiculousness of using that term in our lifetime. Anyway, um, the, the, um, in, in the early days of not-for-profit folks, the intent was that you would work, that leaders would work to eliminate the need for their, for their organization, that they ultimately would be in service, that there would be no more homeless, there would be no more hunger. Like, I, I, love, the, I love the aspirational and honestly a little bit of naivety. Um, when we think about um, some of the not-for-profits and some of the things that, that all of us are taking on and naivety in a very good way. The next piece that I want to just speak to um, using this particular visual is um, the, the how piece. So everything is in service of the vision and everything that going the opposite direction, well, well, how are we gonna to get to the vision? You're gonna work on the mission. How are you gonna to work to the mission? You're gonna be able to identify what those success initiatives are. So that it's a very nice flow so that anybody in your org organization, no matter where they sit, sees, okay, so why am I doing what I'm doing? And how can I support the work that's being done. So just a just a um, what we think of as a very interactive and dynamic way to look at strategic planning, because um, we're huge supporters and proponents that no uh, strategic plan um, spends you know a, a weekend at a retreat um, you know back in the day, and then it gets put on a shelf and nobody else sees it again. So we're, what I hope you pick up from this conversation is the um, dynamism of the strategic plan. So I want to just talk a little bit about um, the values, the vision, and the mission, and, um, and then give you some examples of um, how they can be in service and, and of use. So a vision, as we know, is that aspirational and inspirational statement of an ideal state. 
it really is, um, well, it, well, we're saying there in that slide, it grounds the group. It also lifts the group up. It is, it's, we like having um, vision statements that will never be achieved. And let me tell you, when we work with some pretty grounded uh, board of directors, they're, they're, we get a lot of pushback saying, well, that's ridiculous. Why would we do something like that when it'll never be achieved? Because we get excited about it. As humans, we get excited about something that can be quite grandiose. Um, so we've got a, a two points there. One is um, you can have a societal vision or you can have an organizational vision. So honestly, as a rule of thumb, I'm going to say in the past, almost entirely our not-for-profit uh, clients have had a societal um, vision, which means exactly to one of my earlier points is we see a world where no no person goes hungry. We see a world in which, and in fact, you're going to see some of these um, visions in just a minute around um, where everyone has a, a place that they can call home. So it's a societal. It's about we genuinely and intently want to have a better world in which we live. Or it can be an organizational vision. And these ones, we, we actually do support organizational visions particularly when an organization is um, in the throes of change, because it helps organizations get anchored in regards to, okay, so what are we supposed to be doing? So organizational visions are when um, an organization wants to be the best, the most recognized, um, the most um, uh, clear in serving the needs of. And so just the not so subtle difference, but the vision can be either in service of society as a whole, or it can be, we wanna be the best organization. And there really is, if there's, no, there's no right or wrong. It really does um, completely, I would say, speak to what the needs are of the organization at the time. So then we move to mission. Uh, the mission, as we know, really defines the fundamental purpose of the organization. What is, what do you, what do, you do? Like, and the, the mission, should be as simple so that when someone comes to your website, because then we'll talk about for sure having these on your website, if you talk about um, uh, what your organization does, if you have a mission statement that really does just kind of roll off the tongue of each and every one of your board members, each, each and every one of your staff members, um, it's going to be that much easier for folks to be able to engage with you and say, oh, tell me a little bit more, or, or to be able to really um, identify and um, uh, support the need that you're addressing. So, you know, why is it that you exist? Um, what you are here to do in pursuit of your vision? Uh, what do you do or provide? And for whom do you do it to? And in some cases, you can actually tap into how you do it. So we've got our mission is what is it that you as an organization does to fulfill the vision that you believe is important and necessary in our world today? So then we have our values and I put a slash in here, guiding principles, because we're seeing more and more organization use the term guiding principles. We're starting to get some other language around um, behaviors, around um, commitments, anything that allows um, the people within your organization and the people, um, the community that you're serving understands what it is that you see is important and of value. When um, this whole idea of values came out, I was still uh, working, working with RBC Financial Group, and that was back in the 90s. And um, I, I still remember very clearly when there seemed to be a, a bit of a shift of where the not-for-profit world was starting to come into corporate and corporate was starting to find its way into the not-for-profit world. And um, I was uh, in learning and development with RBC. And to me, the values were the biggest win ever when it came to shared leadership, when it came to employee engagement. Because these values were something that you could hold anyone in the organization to account in a way that drew attention to what is accepted behavior. Because the, the values and the guiding principles 
are absolutely about how we behave on a day-to-day -day basis as we act out on our mission and we obtain our vision. It's how we hold people to account. It's how we regard and behave as you can see the list there, one another, our community, our vendors, any and all stakeholders um, possible. We really are uh, huge supporters of um, using the values and the guiding principles in uh, performance management, both of the board of directors, but also as all employees. Um, you know, it's that, it's the common refrain that I often like to say is, so how is this in value? How are you living in values of the organization? So now values are a really important um, part, so much so that we're not supporters of coming up with the catchwords of, oh, trust, respect, integrity. Because honestly, folks, if we're not living in that way, we got some other work that's got to be done. But the piece about values that we do like, if we're going to use those kinds of words, is really put them in service. What does it mean to the organization? And the other part, too, is um, we're real strong supporters of values being looked at on a, um, so sorry, let me just dial back. Sometimes organizations will go, you know what, we're locked in, we got a really good handle on our vision, mission, and values, and then we don't look at them for 20 years. Well, just the very nature of humans, values change over time. And what we like to see is, um, is being the values recommitted to. And when we say they change over time, it's okay, I've got the, as an organization, we've got the trust, respect, integrity, we got it dialed. We're showing that every single time. But what we want to do is we want to draw attention to new values. We want to draw attention to um, inclusion. And trust me, just about everybody is using inclusion right now when we're working with them, because we have to, because we need to. It is not front of mind for organizations. So um, the values are a, are a beautiful way to engage in all kinds of dialogue with our stakeholders. So I just want to give you a, an example of uh, one of our clients that's been super fun to work with over the years. And this is where I had commented that um, we've got some different language around vision and mission. So um, in, in their noble cause, so I, I really did. I kind of laughed when they were saying, no, 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 Kathy, vision isn't enough. We need something better. And honestly, as a consultant, I went, really? Do you really need something better? And it is so served this organization. This is a member-driven organization for the Alberta Seniors and Community Housing Association. And they are so behind their noble cause. And it's, and it's a cause worth fighting for. It's a cause worth working towards. So you can see that while... Um, it, it's not it's not a vision per se. It is absolutely something that um, they're striving for. So then we've got um, the other change that they have done, and these these folks are just so innovative. They're just so they're very very leading edge. I think in in how they're serving their members is um, they've just come up with let's not complicate this. This is a purpose statement. This is what we do. This is just what we do and how we do it. And then we've got these um, values. And these, these have been with them actually for a number of years, but what has changed is the statements below them. What has changed is how these core values are being looked at. So within a strategic planning process, and, and all of this will make sense in the next slide as we get into kind of um, what is the flow here. Within the strategic planning process, we're just really strong supporters of taking a look at these three key elements of a plan and how personalized are they? How have they shifted or changed or how have the needs shifted or changed as um, time has passed? So let's, let's get into this whole idea of a general approach to strategic planning. So I'm going to guess that, um, that, actually, let's just have a quick show of hands. How many of you folks um, have done at least one or more strategic plans? So if you could kind of pop your hands up or use the icon, have been part of one or more strategic plans in the creation of? 
Excellent, excellent. We get some raised hands, folks. That's awesome. Okay, so what I'm, what please, as I go through this, um, by all means, jump in into the chat box if you want, or you know, draw to attention that no, Kathy, actually, this is how we've done it. But there are there are many, many ways to get there. And just as a as a side, um, I, uh, and for those of you that were on the call last um, month when we talked about the value of collaboration, I think I mentioned that I'm. A new board member to the arts place, um, uh, arts place here in Canmore, and we're just starting a strategic planning process that is very, it's a very different process than I've ever been in, but it generically follows the same phase. So this is the introduction, or sorry, this is, this is kind of our entry into um, what this approach might look like. So the first phase is understanding the past and the current state. I think it's a, um, I think that if we don't do a look back, if only for a brief um, uh, time, if, if we miss that, that hindsight view, um, we, al we also lose the opportunity for gaining insight. So understanding the past and the current state really does allow, so where have we been? Where have our successes been? And um, what do we really want to be looking at? What, 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 what is it that we need to um, pay attention to through this planning process? And part of that is through understanding our past and current state. Um, and then we um, slide into engaging the stakeholders. And, and um, for those of you that are looking at the slides, you know that the next slide has a lot more detail. So just hold tight for that. So we don't. We want to make sure that as an organization, we're not internally focused. We're not uh, very uh, internally kind of introverted in our assessment of ourselves, and we really want to engage our stakeholders. And we do that in a variety of ways: um, asking questions, holding focus groups, having surveys, or uh, any number of ways to ensure that um, the folks that we view are our stakeholders have a say in um, how we've been doing. And then we need to make sense of this information. So this, this um, making sense of it is, okay, so what have they been telling us? And, and then how does that impact our vision, our mission, our strategic priorities, our values? And then what are the priorities that we should be focusing on? So the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three, um, I would say are um, definitely a um, work that is done by a small group of people. When we think about, so how do you get this plan up and on the road or up and up and started is um, we, we like to work with a, what we refer to as a strategic planning committee. It's, it's an ad hoc committee that is um, sanctioned by the board of directors to be able to um, have a voice, make some decisions, and then bring everything back to the board of directors. Within that um, strategic planning um, committee, we like to have a mix of board members and uh, staff. Some of your organizations, you're a one, one person um, entity, so that's, that's fine. So work with, have you as, as part of that um, driving force, but then pull in another couple of people from, that you can count on from your um, board of directors. And honestly, depending on what your organization is, somebody that really likes your, the work that you're doing. You don't have to be a formal entity. And again, because I'm not entirely sure just how big some of our organizations are that are represented, um, you may be just, as I say, a one person. Um, organization. So I'm going to say don't do it alone. I think strategic planning on your own, there, it, there's some limitations to it. So try and pull some people in. But phase one, phase two, and phase three are where you've got a small group and you're bringing in a larger group at a different, at a variety of times. But the sense making really is in the small group. I'm sure all of you will appreciate never, never wordsmith in a gang. That's never, a, that's never an, an effective use of time. One or two people can be very, very effective, or actually, sorry, two or three people can be very effective when it comes to, okay, so what are we really doing? What do we really want it to look like? What is, what is, a, what is the language that we want to choose? So then we move into um, attending to the details and building the one-year operational plan. That truly is a handoff to the administration. That is the handoff to the executive director, 
um, the CEO, the president, whoever, whatever the senior leader is in your organization, because that's where we start to plan things out. So let me just um, pop into the next uh, slide because it's got a bit more detail that that maybe I've missed in the in this um, uh, in this last uh, slide. So let's get into. So if we were to look at taking a look at um, the very first phase of the past and present. So this is where you really want to open the books. You really want to have folks take a look at any and all of those items that are currently operating within your uh, organization. And again, depending on the age and the sophistication of the agency, you could have all of those plus, 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 or it could just be one or two of those items. But in order to really be able to say, where are we? How did we get there? And how effective are we? Um, we need to be able to look at as much as we can of how the organization's been operating. So then we engage in the, the stakeholders. So stakeholders are all of those folks that are listed um, are listed there. Isn't that funny? I don't have board members in there. Okay, totally board members should be in there. Sorry about that. Um, th this is, these are folks that are doing the same kind of work as you. These are folks that uh, maybe are existing partners or want to be partners and ask them, get their input on the things that you believe are important. So how we engage stakeholders and, and I can't help but think, and honestly, folks pop in the chat box if uh, you've got some uh, really great ways that um, you could add to this with regards to how do you engage your stakeholders. Um, there's a number of ways we've worked it. So we do quite a broad, um, uh, probably about a five to seven questionnaire online, like through a survey monkey. We're always cautious about um, surveys because uh, people, I mean, it's a love-hate relationship with surveys, but what it can do is it can really get a whole bunch of information. The other piece too is just be aware of how much data you're gathering and, and you don't want to be overwhelmed by it. But a survey can get a whole bunch of information and then you start to by um, finding out what the responses are, mix of uh, closed-ended questions, um, number rating questions with regards to how are you doing, how do you see us, um, are we the meeting, the needs in the community, uh, what, are, what have we missed in the community, um, you start to get a sense of, of being able to narrow things down. Then you can start to put real voices and faces behind that, and you can have focus groups. Okay, so this is what the data told us in the Survey Monkey. Can you help us get underneath it? Can you help us tell, tell us a little bit about how you would interpret it and how might we want to interpret it? The other thing that we do uh, quite often, now this takes manpower or person power, sorry, um, is do one on one uh, voice interviews. And it's, it is super useful, but it's time consuming. So be aware of that. Um, and then we've got, uh, we just did a, a group of uh, stakeholder engagement with an organization we're working with right now. Zoom has been absolute um, perfect for that because people will give you an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half on Zoom, small group conversation, get them moving in and out of the breakout rooms, and you're going to get a lot of data, get people um, uh, have support in uh, being scribes there. Kind of for those of you that are familiar with the um, World Cafe, um, this is a this is a a, a um, this is a way a a, mo, a, a World Cafe light um, approach to being able to get some of the the data from the stakeholders. So then we want to do some analysis with it. And I'm going to suggest that probably all folks are uh, familiar with the um, strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, there's also uh, strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and obstacles. Again, we, we language is interesting and, and evolving. What you wanna do is um, in order to, to be, have your planning grounded in um, 
kind of in fact-based information as much as you can, you want to be able to make sense of all of that input that you got from your stakeholders. Another way to assess um, and analyze the information is through the PESTLE. Some of you might be familiar with that. So that's the political, the uh, economic, societal, technological, legal, and uh, did I say economic? Yes, environmental is the second E. And so this, we like PESTLE because it, it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated, folks. It's a little bit, no, really, what's happening environmentally? What do we need to be considering when it comes to technology? Uh, like so many of our organizations that we're working with um, uh, in the not-for-profit are making that shift to technology, but not necessarily bringing somebody on board um, by way of an employee that can actually help them with that. So these, we, we just think that the pestle is, as I said, a little bit more, um, gets underneath a little bit more when we start to um, do some analysis. So again, political, economic, societal, technological, legal, and environmental. So then we take that information and want to make some sense of it. So how does everything that you've been able to pull from your stakeholders, um, what are the deliverables on that? So what, what is what you've learned or what, yeah, of what you have learned, how has it impacted where you want to go as an organization? Has the world changed a bit that you need to take a look at your vision? Does it need to be tweaked? And we're huge supporters in subtle, slight language changes. And I think those of you that have gone through this process, one or two words in a vision or a mission, mission, all of a sudden just bring you back into today. So it's not necessarily a full on, and honestly, almost never is a full on a change to your vision and mission, um, but it might it might allow you to get a little bit more crystal. The other thing too is you might, through that stakeholder engagement, you might see that there are in um, there are other people in the community that are doing similar work as you are, but not exactly the same. This is the opportunity to differentiate yourself um, by by taking a look at the vision, the mission, um, the measurements that you are considering, and the priorities. And of course, already talked about the values. Um, this is a time, what did you hear from your stakeholders? What needs to be addressed there? And then start to look at the outputs. This is when you start to look at within those uh, priorities. So what are the services and programs and information that you need to pay attention to? Um, and, then, and then who needs to be involved in that? The community, the clients, the government. More and more of our organizations are putting... Um, advocacy in as one of their strategic priorities, like the getting the attention of the government to the um, to the community that folks are serving is is really becoming more and more the work of our not for profits, as well as serving the clients there and the community that they're advocating for. So so please, you know, somewhere if appropriate, make sure that those outputs and the making sense of the information somehow has the government pulled into that. And then, of course, um, the last one and our last phases of um, building the one and one, one to one, or the one year operational plan, sorry, and attending to the details is truly the operations work. This really is when the executive director, um, senior staff, if you have them, really get in and take a look at, all right, so what has to happen at the management level in order for this strategic plan to be a success? We just finished working at, actually with ASHA, the group that I just showed you, and um, some of the staff were saying, well, we, we're, we, just need, we just need to hire more people. We just need to hire more people. And I think any of you folks that have been in, in uh, business for a while, it's not nearly that simple. It's not quite that straightforward. And uh, so through the strategic planning process, and, it, and this is some of the younger folks that are coming in. These are the, the folks in their um, late 20s, early 30s that um, have great, great ideas 
but don't necessarily understand what it takes, what the, what the real cost is to bring people into the organization. And so this is where um, just a beautiful opportunity for education for kind of your future leaders is, so how do we justify more staff coming in? How do we justify changes in people's mandates? So the human resources plan, um, how do we actually orchestrate those changes in the work that people are doing to meet the current strategic plan? Because what we see in a lot of cases is that um, some folks are continuing to do things that serve the old strategic plan and not necessarily are the priorities of the new strategic plan. This, folks, is the purview of the executive director and, in some cases, cases beautiful opportunity for um, the chair of the board to really be the coach, be the advocate, and be the uh, key liaison with that executive director. So I see here really three big chunks of work. And um, so the stakeholder engagement, this is again working with your strategic planning committee, whatever, whoever they are. And again, the kind of the strategic planning committee number is kind of five to seven, no more than seven. Five is honestly the sweet spot there. Um, this is some heavy lifting there. And again, please, if you missed it the first time I said it, your stakeholders should include your board of directors. Um, then the next big chunk is, okay, so what do we, what do we make sense with this? This piece here is where we usually find a one day retreat. This is where, and, and we're huge fans of sleepovers if we could do it with few, uh, once I'm fairly confident we will get to the face-to-face um, -to -face again, is if you can have a day and a half with um, all of the board members, all of the seniors, or all of the staff, depending on the size of the organization, or at least the senior staff. Because this is a beautiful time to be able to feed in all this really rich information, help folks make sense of this. And from that, you're going to get that, as I said, that recommitment to the vision, mission, and the values. Um, and the biggest piece here is your priorities. What do the strategic priorities look like going forward? And then the next big chunk of work, of course, is handing all of that over. And the operations work is, um, and I'll, I'll say this again at the end, and you've got a slide there, is that, that the operations work should include, can include, could include, however you want to put that, um, a way for the board of directors to be kept apprised of the progress of the work being forward, going forward. And so whatever is designed in the operations work, try and uh, create it in a way that is going to serve you, the executive director reporting to the board of directors. Because what we don't want to do is uh, have multiple reports from the executive director um, to the board of directors, like, can we streamline this? Can we, you know, use tools and language and processes that the executive director only has to create once? And it's going to serve board of directors, and it's also going to serve their staff, all right? Okay, so um, success factors. So this is uh, when we start talking about measurements. And um, I think that we have changed um, I don't know. I, I think it depends on your organization. I was going to say we've changed away from having only qualitative to uh, quantitative. I really do think it just depends on, on what your organization is, uh, who you're serving, um, what do you view as success. Um, but the success factors um, were huge supporters if you, could, if you could include some kind of quality in there. And I've got some examples that I'll show you in a second. Um, these success factors can be um, on an annual basis. They can become a part of the operational plan, if that makes sense. And for those, for organizations that are kind of, I mean, you do have measurements, but they're more kind of tacit or gut check measurements, and you're wanting to, to have them more overt or more um, uh, easy for everyone to be able to um, kind of get their head around, then I'd recommend just doing it on an annual basis, being able to go, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play around with some measurements, and we're going to see if they're the right measurements. In a lot of organizations, we say um, for the first year, you're going you're gonna to create measurements. 
we, we have worked with a lot of organizations that do not have a baseline measurement to work or build from or compare to. So year one, we're gonna come up with some. Um, you can also have some that are the life of the strategic plan. And, and those, those really kind of line with the, the aspirational vision. Um, we tend not to use or make those recommendations. Um, they, they can sometimes get in the way of really the work of the organization. But again, I mean, that's if, if, if folks, if that works for your organization, then that's great. But we do always encourage, how do you know you get there? How do you know that what you're doing is um, on the right track? And what I really like is when the strategic plan is used as the performance management tool for um, the executive director. And so try and have something in there that would be viewed as a success factor. So then we get into the strategic priorities. So we've we got a really good handle on what your organization does, where it's going, how people are going to um, behave in it. You have a sense of what your measurements are going to be then um this is what we view as strategic buckets which is kind of why i have that basket in there and it's those high level priorities that you're going to be focused on so these are uh, ways <clears throat> in which you believe as an organization, we got to focus some attention. So it's addressing the opportunities for enhancing your organization's performance, really making use of your strengths, but and also being able to address maybe some of the weaknesses. And, and some of these samples, some of the examples will speak to kind of how that makes sense. Um, you can either eliminate or maybe even reduce some of the threats that may have come out of the analysis. Um, and we really want it to be practical. So this is, this is where that um, aspirational vision of a greater world or a better world and um, that kind of this is what we do hits the road. These strategic priorities is where um, everyone in your organization could be at a place that goes, I know what I do to make these a reality. So the strategic priorities are buckets of um, areas of focus. We're huge, huge supporters of having no more than five. Three is a sweet spot, and we're finding that organizations are find, or, um, feeling that that actually is enough. But three to five, we've worked with organizations that are working with eight and 12 priorities. And to be honest, I think, how on earth do you focus? Like You're getting work done, but how on earth do you focus? So this one I just pulled off the off a website. I mean, you gotta love uh, Google, right? So um, this one I, I wanted to show you because it was very, very clear that they have three strategic priorities. One is about accessibility for Sahana software. The other is about how do you engage in the community? And the other one is about funding. So just very super black and white, makes perfect sense, very little room for kind of, um, of uh, other interpretation. The success factors are there, um, talks about needs to be accessible to organizations, communities, it needs to be valued. So um, I, I'm thinking about needs to be accessible to organizations, and communities, you could put a qualitative, no, sorry, quantitative number in there. Valued is a qualitative measurement and wider and more sustainable impact could then be um, uh, uh, converted into quantitative um, measurements as well. So the idea here is that accessibility, the strategic pillar is plain and simple, make Sahara more accessible. And we're, we really are fans of the verb noun kind of a, a um, approach. So they're make Sahara more accessible, strengthen Sahara community, develop. So these ones are very, as I say, very straightforward. And then the priorities underneath them are how you get there. But from a board of directors perspective, they're going to stop at that strategic pillar place. Now, very, very simple, very straightforward, but I hope you get a sense of, okay, so that's what we're trying to do here. Let's not overcomplicate it. Um, as a board member, you know what you're doing. As an employee, you know what you personally can do to be able to engage with um, each one of those pillars. 
So a, a few more examples here. So this is a this is Canterbury Foundation. This is a, a client that we worked with last year. This is a housing organization. So the mission is Canterbury provides safety, comfort, independence, and connection to support meaningful lives. So let me tell you that that particular mission was a tricky one to get through the board of directors. This organization is over 50 years old, I think, and um, the executive director, super leading edge, super wants to get out ahead of, um, ahead of her competitors in a way that's going to best serve the people that they work with. And so the vision here is Canterbury is a leader enhancing the role and place of seniors in society. This one is an organizational vision. And the priorities absolutely serve their organization. So it was funny, I was actually talking to my partner, uh, Jeff, and we had done this uh, strategic plan, as I said, uh, last year, all on Zoom, super interesting. And these strategic priorities were, were pretty, they were pretty interesting to work through, but they completely served the um, um, CEO and her senior leadership team because they, they have so much knowledge about serving seniors. They wanted to expand it and they wanted to share it. They wanted to get really clear on who it is that Canterbury is serving. And they really want to look at different ways to be able to serve their community. So these, this one I wanted to show you is because they're not, not, this is not a cookie cutter approach. This is probably the exact opposite of the Sahara example that I gave you. But this one, the senior leaders got excited. They were, they were pumped. They were keen around um, what they're going to be doing over the next five years. The other piece that I want to uh, point out is when you're doing a strategic plan, you want to be able to set the context for your public with a planning statement. And, and this one was entering into a strategic plan. So if any of you folks that are on this call today are thinking that it's time to do a strategic plan, think about why. Think about what's going on for your organization. Think about what's happening for the community. Think about why is it important now for you to do this planning and then come up with a bit of a we need to do this because, because when we can really clearly discern that it's not just because our strategic plan is now up um, that we're going to do it, but in fact, we need to look at our strategic plan because our world has changed, because um, we have other focuses that we believe need to need our attention. Um, to have this kind of a kind of a context setting also allows um, uh, strategic plans that maybe aren't due yet to get pulled off the shelf and dusted and maybe taken another look at. So set the context for your public that you're going to be um, engaging with, with a planning statement. All right, so another one that I just wanted to share uh, quite quickly is uh, this was a, a organization that we worked with our colleagues, um, Miller Consultants down in Kentucky, just a phenomenal uh, a group of folks in Flint, Michigan. If any of you are familiar with Flint, they had um, uh, all of their water was contaminated for a number of years. Just It was just a community in crisis. And we worked with the Flint uh, Genesee uh, Literacy Network. And uh, again, unbelievable opportunity and privilege to work with people that are very focused on literacy in their community. And each one of these priorities you'll see is um, headed up with exactly the same language. And it was all about where you wanna focus. So this is where we think it's really important that as a group that's coming together to do a strategic plan, don't, don't just engage in a cookie cutter approach if it's not going to serve you. And you know, when we, um, when we were working with them on this particular uh, topic, we said, you know, why don't we have a overarching statement that all of our work is um, through collective action? <clears throat> and they push back so lovely and say, no, we need this repeated, repeated, repeated. And, and it ends up being just a very, very strong message that no matter what it is that this organization is doing, 
it's going to be through collective action. When I went online to pull this um, off their website, so this was, we did in, we finished it up in January of 2019. And since then, they have hired, I think I counted four additional staff to be able to meet the needs of this uh, organization. So this was an organization in completely in transition, just very, very exciting. And I'm going to say that the work that they did on the strategic plan helped them get there. So again, just other samples to get you thinking about what is your strategic plan look like or what might you want your strategic plan to look like. Okay, just a couple more slides here. And I and again, for those of you folks that were on um, the August uh, webinar, I also made a comment about not-for-profit life cycles. And, and why I think that this is important to share here is um, strategic plans, there's different strategic plans and different priorities that are needed depending on where you are in the life cycle of your organization. So again, the idea, I always love using this example that the idea usually comes with, comes on the back of a napkin um, with uh, probably uh, beer or wine stained on it at some point, um, because that's where the conversations came from to get to get the idea up and running. And then you move into startup, you have to get a little bit more focused, then you shift into growth, startup and growth, big, big, big differences within a life cycle, because you've got to start getting organized, you've got to get focused on where are you going, uh, focused on who's going to get you there, you shift into maturity, you're starting to get known, and in some cases, you may start to lose sight of where you are, which is so important in strategic planning to not just allow yourself to decline unless you've met your vision. So, and then of course, we've got to turn around and this is a beautiful time. If you think that, ooh, if we're starting, you know, maybe if we haven't actually really got our um, organization focus where it needs to be, this is where a perfect time is at the turnaround stage for strategic planning. So I just, I just did a little bit of brainstorming here for, for folks to think about, okay, so if you're in any one of those areas, you may want to think about you know, what might the strategic priorities be that you need to focus on? Idea and startup is really proofing the product or the services that you have. Like what kind of, what kind of um, ability do you have to start to move into the growth of your actual um, services that you're providing and to? So I, I, I don't need to go through each of those. I just wanted to leave those two for you as a way of thinking, okay, so where are we in our particular life cycle? And do we have the right strategic priorities that are getting the excitement of you in whatever role you're playing in your organization? But also, are they the right strategic priorities to help others get excited about your organization? So using the strategic plan, last couple here, folks. Um, using it, using it, using it using it. <laughs> this is, we're huge supporters of um, one-page strategic plans. Actually, the ones that I just showed you, one-pagers, um, publish it uh, for sure on the website. Um, I already mentioned this, create the executive director's annual objectives and performance review from it. Um, for board members that are on the call, um, see how you can do a board evaluations using the strategic plan, the strategic priorities for it. Um, the executive directors or senior staff provide, well, provide the uh, strategic plan to your staff, but, but hopefully they've been part of it, but ask them to create their annual objectives or job mandate. If you can get your employees more involved in writing their own strategic uh, priorities, their own objectives, th there's just so much more buy-in that happens. It really does allow your employees to be the creative folks that you've hired them to be. And the last one, I, I, I'm a huge supporter, cut and paste everywhere. Um, what ideally will happen, and again, you know, come up with a one pager to be able to publish it, but there's a journey that gets you to your one pager. So that's where, um, you know, if you've got a strategic planning statement, if you've got things about the organization that you've learned, if you've got a um, go through that whole analysis and what is the, the um, outcome of the analysis that you had, 
those often tell the story that is required on grant proposals or annual reports. So really try and create a strategic plan that can be cut and pasted absolutely everywhere. Uh, tracking and reporting. This one, again, I just pulled it off the web, you guys. There's so many um, different uh, tools. And this one actually is a pretty good one. I certainly um, edited it to fit the appropriate organization. But have a section for each one of the strategic priorities. And the executive direct report is far more detailed than what would go to the um, board of directors, but at least it's the same information. And have staff be able to uh, fill out their own sections. Um, there was, we work with some organizations that a senior staff takes on one of the strategic priorities. Sometimes that works nice and neat, sometimes it doesn't. But tracking and reporting, uh, don't, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot, and I do feel I've been talking nonstop, is um, just don't leave your uh, strategic plan kind of hang in there. Make sure you close it with a way to be able to report to, um, to your stakeholders. It's just got to come out in the annual report um, to your board of directors and to your staff. And then um, probably one of my favorite, good old Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, probably not, uh, not a new quote for any of you folks on the line. Uh, but there we have it, 1258. I'm, I'm, I feel like I have been hosing you down with a bunch of information. Um, Moselle, um, do you wanna just kind of pick it up from there? I'm just looking to see if there's any chats or any questions. Sure, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either um, unmute yourself and, and come on or, or drop it in the chat box there. Um, and in the meantime, if, if while we wait for that, I'll just say that if you can save the date for October 26, we're gonna be doing an event on, uh, or sorry, a, a speaker series on event planning. So save the date there. Did anyone have any questions? I think you've covered everything so uh, in such a, a professional way, Kathy. Really appreciate all the knowledge that you've imparted to everyone today. That was really uh, a lot of content, and really appreciate that so much. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Moselle. These are these are just super. Uh, very much appreciating uh, the work that uh, you're doing with Bow Valley nonprofits. Um, I I just. Not, not for profits is the way to go, folks. I just can't say enough. Yvette, I see that you've got your hand raised. It's the load on my internet. And I has, um, um, keeps telling my oven times. I see that you're recording and every time I get reconnected, um, so you're right, Yvette, you are popping in and out. So yes, we are recording. Hey, Moselle, where can folks get the recording? Yes, it tells um, me. it'll take me a couple hours to add it to uh, YouTube. Uh, and then the links are on the Bow Valley website. So uh, Bow Valley Nonprofits. Um, and there's a training page on there that's got links to all the previous recordings. And I'll be popping this one up there later today. Super. Uh, thanks very much, folks. Just, it's lovely to see all of your faces. I was scrolling through every once in a while. Uh, just always nice to know that we're not talking into an abyss, as you all can appreciate. And um, look forward to, at some point, seeing our faces at a lunch. Go figure. <laughs> Absolutely. We're hoping to do a, some kind of networking event uh, we were hoping to do it this fall, but we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit longer, but fingers crossed for the new year. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much that Kathy really, really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone to, for attending as well. Super. Thanks so much, Moselle. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.